Okay, here we are, our class, uh, elders, deacons, preachers, and saints. This is lesson number eight in this series, uh, The Role and Work of Deacons, and this is part two of that particular topic. All right, last week uh, I started the section in this series uh, dealing with uh, deacons, deacons in the church, and uh, said that in the New Testament, or in, the, in, in New Testament society, Deacons were actually uh, table attendants and messengers. They were, uh, of course, willing servants as opposed to bond slaves or forced labor. The writers of the New Testament chose this particular word to describe the role of a particular servant in the church. So they appropriate a word that was being used uh, and gave it meaning uh, for a particular or specific role in the church. Um, the explanation of their role and qualifications is limited to uh, not too many places, only three places in the Bible, in the New Testament. And from two of these passages, uh, we've been able to put together a bit of a profile of this person and their work. So we know, first of all, uh, they were men who were selected by the congregation from among the congregation. Uh, we also know they were spiritual and talented uh, men and their choice was based on their basic qualifications. You know, the elders uh, laid out the type of men uh, that should be selected and the church went forward and selected those men among themselves. And, and then they were approved by the leaders and given charge responsibility over the work uh, to which they were called. So once confirmed by the elders, they were responsible for their own particular work. They were in charge of the task and they were making sure that it was carried out in a proper way. We also learned that as deacons, they held no authority as a group, unlike the elders to whom authority was given over the congregation as a group. Uh, the, the deacons as a group had no such authority. They were chosen from the church uh, they were there uh, to serve the church in some way, but they were not responsible uh, individually or as a group for the overall direction uh, of the church. That responsibility was in the hands uh, and continues to be in the hands of the elders or the pastors or the bishops, you know, different words that explain uh, the role of the elder. Also, you could have many deacons doing small tasks. It didn't have to be a huge responsibility. It could be a small task in the church, so long as the individual man was qualified from a personal perspective, a character perspective, and also was qualified to be able to do that particular work. So you could have 20 deacons if you want, each working in a different specific area of the church. All right, today's lesson, I want to examine a final passage of scripture regarding the deacons, and that's in 1 Timothy chapter 3. So I encourage you to open your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, and we are going to read uh, verses 8 to 13 in a moment. But first, I want to go back to Acts chapter 6. We won't read that, but in Acts chapter 6, um, that passage reveals the work and spiritual maturity of these servants of the church and how they were selected. So we talked about that last week. And then the second passage we talked about last week was in Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. And that passage confirms the fact that they were recognized as a specific role within the church apart from the elders and the preachers because Paul addresses the church in his letter and makes reference to the elders and the deacons. So we know that the elders are a specific role, have a specific role in the church, and Paul recognized at that early time in the church that deacons also had a very special role in the church. So today we're going to look at 1 Timothy 3, and this passage gives us some insight as to the basic qualifications necessary to be considered for this role as well as their standing in the body and a little bit of how they were, uh, how they were chosen. Now Paul has outlined in uh, chapter three, verses one to seven, he's outlined the basic qualification for elders in the Lord's church, and then he immediately follows this with qualifications for deacons. So we've already gone over uh, you know, chapter three, one to seven in previous lessons when we talked about 
um, the qualification of elders. So now we're going to pick it up in verse 8 to look at what he says about deacons. So let's look at that. Verse 8, uh, chapter uh, 3, he says, therefore, uh, excuse me, he says uh, in verse 8, he says, deacons likewise must be men of dignity, not double-tongued or addicted to much wine or fond of sordid gain. So insofar as character is concerned, deacons are to resemble elders. Why? Because Paul says likewise. You know, he bridges the two groups. He's talked about elders and their qualifications and then he says likewise, meaning in the same way that I'm talking about you know, elders, I'm now talking about deacons, about their qualifications. Then he says, uh, he uses the term must. And the term must means that there is no question about the need to be strict in requiring these qualifications for the role of deacons. He says, likewise, deacons must. It's not, well, if you think maybe they have this you know, close enough, or if, if, if it comes close in the general area, no. He's very, very specific. They must have these qualifications in order to serve. So what does he say? Well, first of all, he said they should be men of dignity. Uh, another word is grave, serious-minded. Signifies a man who is respected, someone who is flip, uh, not flippant, meaning you know, he takes things uh, seriously, uh, not an individual who is coarse in his language or in his uh, manner. Uh, then he says, not someone who is double-tongued, uh, refers to one who is you know, a hypocrite. You know, someone talks out of both sides of their mouth at once, not a hypocrite not someone who is insincere, not someone who is you know, talking behind people's back. It's a sensitive job, you know, being a deacon, you're responsible, sometimes you oversee the finances of the church in a certain area, so it's very easy to uh, get yourself into trouble if you don't have control over your tongue, if you're talking about other people, if you're having problems with someone, uh, for example, in trying to work something out, uh, that you begin you know, divisive behavior by talking against that person to this person. You know, uh, in a church, it's very easy to, um, very easy to start. Uh, he says also, uh, not given to much wine. Someone who is sober, not a brawler. Um, moderation in the use of wine as it was consumed in that time. Notice he doesn't say no wine, you know, teetotaler, he doesn't say that. He said not addicted to much wine. In that time they mixed water with the wine to drink. They drank uh, low alcohol content wine. It wasn't like today, the process is uh, different. Today uh, uh, the uh, distillers and, and, and those who create uh, uh, you know, alcoholic uh, drinks uh, and, and wine um, are able to put more uh, alcohol content, but in that time the alcohol content was still low, uh, but however uh, moderate drinking necessary so it would not produce drunkenness. Uh, so these were not uh, you know, moderate social drinkers. You know, some people use this here as a way to excuse moderate social drinking. These men were not moderate social drinkers. They drank wine as their primary drink. And so they had to be careful not to let it lead to abuse and to drunkenness. And then he says, not uh, fond of sordid gain. Now in the original context, this expression meant a person who earned a living in a sordid or an unclean way. So someone involved in questionable business practices. You know, uh, I, I won't even name anything, I certainly don't want to get into that kind of trouble, but uh, someone who was uh, uh, you know, earning their living through gambling, for example, or certainly prostitution, or uh, stealing, or cheating, any way which is shameful as a Christian, and also people who liked this type of uh, way of, of, of earning money. So they wanted someone who uh, 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 was open, someone who had a clear conscience about how they uh, earned a living, and someone um, who would not be repudiated, someone who would not be uh, rejected or spoken badly of uh, 
uh, because of the way that they earned uh, a living. And then we go to uh, uh, verse nine in chapter three. He says, but holding to the mystery of faith with a clear conscience. So the mystery of faith is the gospel. That's the mystery of faith. You know, the way people were to be saved was a mystery that no one knew until Christ came and actually revealed it. Uh, Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 16, verses 25 and 26. So men who are able to believe and practice their faith with a clear conscience, not people who are undignified or hypocritical or drunken or impure or greedy and pretending to be faithful. You understand what I'm saying? Unfortunately, many times there are people in the church who are sitting in the church building, but their heart is not with God. Their conduct during the rest of the time uh, does not reflect uh, a faithful uh, Christian uh, 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 lifestyle. So you know, some believe the, ministry, uh, the mystery of the gospel, they believe it, but they don't act like they do. So Paul is saying here that deacons have to not only believe it, but their actions have to demonstrate that they sincerely believe the gospel and the, and the teachings of Christ. So we keep going in verse 10. It says, these men must also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. So deacons are to have uh, uh, proven that they are qualified before they are appointed. So the church will choose a man that they see doing the work, living a good Christian life, long before he is appointed as a deacon. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 22, Paul warns against being too quick in appointing elders or deacons, lest in their failure the evangelist who appointed them or the elders who appointed them bear a burden of blame. So you mustn't put like a newbie or you know, somebody, to, a rookie, in these, in these, uh, uh, in these posts. Uh, because if they make mistakes, um, uh, the ones who appointed them uh, will be uh, responsible. Also, in saying also, <laughs> he is saying that the period of testing is also required. In other words, it's required for the deacons, but it's also required for the elders because also reaches back to his description. Just like the elders have to be tested before they serve, you know, also the deacons have to be tested before they serve. So men who aren't already providing leadership and service, living holy lives, should not be appointed as elders and deacons. You know, one of the mistakes that we often make is that we see a man who has potential. Uh, he, he's not realizing his potential. He's not serving you know, to the limit that he could be. And we see his potential and we think the way to bring out his potential is to appoint him as an elder or to select him as a deacon, thinking, wow, if he has the responsibility, you know, he'll kind of grow into it. Uh, that doesn't work very well. That doesn't work very well. And, and, and we see here that Paul is saying, uh, uh, before you appoint someone, make sure that they're already doing the task. They're already demonstrating leadership. They're already busy in the service uh, to the Lord and by appointing them as elder or deacon, so on and so forth, you are officially giving that individual the responsibility for that task or the responsibility for that leadership that needs to be recognized by the entire, uh, uh, the entire congregation. Okay, so we move on to verse 11 here, uh, where for a moment he stops talking about the deacons themselves and he talks about uh, women. And we'll, we'll read that verse in verse 11. He says, women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Now, this particular verse has been used to suggest that women should also be appointed to be deacons, uh, what's referred to as deaconesses in the church. And there are certain arguments that people use uh, for this uh, idea. And the arguments, I've kind of you know, watered, not watered them, but compressed them down to three, three main arguments that are used. First uh, argument is that the term woman here can mean wives, as in the wives of the deacon, or the term woman 
uh, can be used as deaconess or servants of the church. So the word itself is uh, flexible. It can be used in a variety of ways. Secondly, in Romans chapter 16, verse one, Paul commends a woman, Phoebe, a servant, he calls her a, a servant or diakonos of the church, and she had brought a message. She had carried a message for Paul. And then that's, that's the second argument. So we should therefore have deaconesses because he refers to her as a servant, a diakonos of the church. And then thirdly, third argument, there are some early writings, uh, non-inspired, non okay, that's important, but early writings that suggest that women served in this capacity in certain churches, uh, but as uh, we need to note, these were not inspired writings and uh, the, their writings appeared long after the apostolic age. A couple of examples, Justinian writes about this matter. Uh, Justinian lived 482, uh, to 565 AD, and John Chrysostom uh, from 349 to 407 AD, just example of writers in the early uh, Christian age who wrote about uh, certain instances of women serving in the church, uh, perhaps serving even as deaconesses. So these are the arguments that are made that in today's uh, churches we should have uh, women uh, serve as deaconesses. And by extension, we should have women who serve as elders, because if you're going to have women serving as deacons and deaconesses, why shouldn't you have women serving as, as elders or as pastors? And you can even go a step further. Well, why not have women serving as evangelists too? If you can have one, why don't you have the other? So this is how the argument is usually built up. And there's usually one other argument that I haven't mentioned here, and that is the argument of culture. You know, in that culture, women had a subordinate role in that culture, and uh, Paul's instructions are based on the idea that you know, he was a chauvinist, you know what I'm saying? He, he comes from a culture where women uh, did not have any leadership position, so he's merely speaking culturally. And now things have changed culturally. Today, women can do all the things that men do, they, all the tasks and jobs, uh, and positions that men have, they, 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 they're, 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 police, uh, they're police officers, firefighters, they can be president, you know, why not have a woman as a deacon in the church? Because times have changed, the culture has changed. Okay, so that's, that's basically the, the arguments that are made. The arguments on the other side, not to have women as deacons. First of all, Paul does not use the term deaconess, all right? Uh, in this passage here in verse 11 that we just read. Uh, he simply uses a word that means wives, or it can be interpreted also just as women, females. Um, had he used the actual term deaconess, there would be no confusion. So you have to kind of stretch it and interpret it and, and massage it to mean deaconess. But you know, he doesn't use that term, you know, female deacon. He doesn't say female deacon, he doesn't say that here. Secondly, the context of this passage uh, is a list of qualifications for men as deacons. And this reference in verse 11 to wives would seem very natural as instruction to the wives of deacons, but also to the wives of elders as well. I mean, think about it. He's talked about elders, their qualifications. He's talked about deacons, their qualifications. And then he adds a section about the wives of these men. I mean, the wives would be involved with people. They would be involved in the work as well. So their character and their conduct had to be above reproach as well. So he lists elders and then deacons and then what? Well, it's only natural. He talks about the wives, the women, that belong to these men, that the, 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 the females uh, 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 part of the partnership of deacons and, and elders. I mean, it's just common sense. And then thirdly, the only examples that we have of deacons doing the work of deacons shows that only men are doing it. In Acts chapter six, verses one to six, the apostles, when they say, okay, here's what we're going to do, 
they specify that men, males, should be selected. It would have been so easy and it would have solved the argument immediately had Peter said, okay, you choose men and women among yourselves who will take care of this. Remember, uh, there was no teaching involved here. You know, in Acts chapter six, what was the problem? Food distribution, food distribution. So he says, you know, I mean, men and women both have the capacity to serve food and they were serving food to who? To women, the widows, okay? And yet still Peter says, choose seven males, men, to be selected. So here you have two opportunities by two different apostles to establish women in this role, but both times Peter and then Paul specify that men should be doing uh, that, uh, this, this particular task. So the stronger evidence, if you're going to weigh the evidence, which way? The evidence that men do this task is much stronger. What we do see, however, in the New Testament are women who are serving. They are diakonosing. In other words, they're waitering in a variety of ways. Uh, for example, women are supporting Jesus' ministry in Luke chapter 8, verse 3. We see women praying in the upper room in Acts verse one. We see Dorcas, a woman, making clothing for the poor in Acts chapter nine. We see Mary, the mother of Mark, Mark, the one who wrote the Gospel of Mark, Mary, the mother of Mark, offering her home as a meeting place for the apostles, Acts chapter 12. And then further on, we see Lydia, offering hospitality to Paul in Acts chapter 16. We see Priscilla offering her house to Paul and along with her husband having a Bible study with Apollos in Acts chapter 18. And then of course we see Phoebe delivering a letter to Paul in Romans chapter 16. So here the Greek word diakonos is used in its messenger sense. In other words, in, in Romans chapter 16, in the other times uh, that, I've, um, that I've mentioned, uh, you see the women serving, not being appointed as deacons, you see them serving like everyone else in the church is serving. And then in Romans chapter 16, verse one, the Greek simply says that she is also serving, but in the quote, the messenger sense. However, um, uh, we don't see the, uh, that women are being chosen by the church and set before the leadership and uh, appointed as deacons. The other thing too is that um, it's very important to uh, note the difference between you know, cult, things that are cultural in the Bible and things that are eternal. I've talked about this before. Things that are cultural are things like the wearing of veils and the washing of feet and the way people dressed and so on and so forth. Those were cultural things. And the Bible comments on those things. And the Bible gives instructions on how to accommodate cultural norms of the time. But then there are eternal things. And the eternal things are things that the apostles wrote about where, the, where the, uh, the, the, the evidence for doing and the authority for doing these things are established by their apostolic authority. You know, Paul reaches all the way back to Genesis to establish the basis for male spiritual leadership in the home as well as in the church. And in the same way, when the apostles gives very specific instructions about the qualifications, they're eternal, they don't change, do they? Uh, the, the individual men who are to be elders have specific qualifications that don't change from generation to generation. The specific qualifications of deacons don't change from generation to generation until Jesus comes. They are eternal things. Now, there are many men who serve in a variety of ways at different times. We see this in the Bible but not all of them are set forth as deacons. So yes, men and women serve in the church in a variety of ways, in a variety of effective ways. Uh, my point is, even, even if all the men are expected to serve in some way in the church, only a few of those men who fulfill 
these qualifications and are selected by the church, only those men will serve as deacons. So the point I'm making here is this. All Christians, men and women, serve. They all wait her. They all uh, take messages. They all work on behalf of the body. But only some of the men who are qualified are chosen by the church and appointed by the elders to be responsible for certain tasks. Therefore, in the verse that we are considering, verse 11, I believe that Paul refers to the wives of deacons. And he says that as wives of deacons, they also must, what does he say? They must be dignified in the same way that the deacons are dignified. And he says they must not be malicious gossips. Of course, it's, it's never okay to be a gossip. But a deacon's wife must especially have a handle on the problems since she, through her husband, is involved with many areas of the work and the people in the church. She must be temperate. I think this is probably one of the, the key qualifications. I mean, they're all important, but in my experience, in church work I've seen a, a lot of problems because Sometimes people, the wives of certain leaders, were not temperate. Temperate meaning sober-minded, not easily carried away by their emotions or arguments or strifes, not easily taking sides in a dispute, not you know, throwing you know, gas on a fire. Women who are temperate, very important. And then he says they should be faithful as a general rule. Faithful in the faith, faithful to come to church. You know? I mean, it's, it's not very encouraging if the elder's wife or the deacon's wife never shows up for services or shows up once in a while for services. It's discouraging. There may be good reasons for that, but it's discouraging to others who are faithful but don't have a leadership position. Faithful in service, faithful in marriage, faithful in friendship and so on and so forth. She is seen as a faithful individual. All right, so let's go to verse 12, continue on. So he switches back now to deacons. So elders need to be this way, deacons need to be this way, pause, and their wives, deacons' wives, elders' wives, they need to be this way as well. And now he continues with a little more information about deacons. So let's read that in verse 12. He says, Deacons must be husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children and their own households. So we return to the issue of the married state of this person. And I want to elaborate a little bit further. Notice here he says that men, you know, read it again, deacons must be the husbands of only one wife. You know, what kind of person is going to be a, a, the husband of only one wife? Well, that, that's going to be a man. So you know, everywhere in the context, in the words, you know, everywhere else, the Bible teaches that, that men need to have this role. And I may be emphasizing this a little bit because there's always, it always comes back, you know, every generation, there's a movement or a push to do away with this type of leadership in the church and to quote modernize you know, or to keep up with the times uh, to begin changing these roles. So this is why I'm kind of sp spending a little extra time here on this uh, subject. Now there's been a variety of ways, as I mentioned, to interpret this passage here about the husband of one wife. Uh, first of all, uh, it can mean that the man has only ever had one wife in his entire life. He got married when he was 20 and now he's 80 and he's had the same wife and she's still alive and he's still alive. So that's one meaning that it can have. Uh, secondly, it can mean a man who may have had more than one wife, meaning he was widowed or he was divorced or perhaps even practiced polygamy at the time, but he now has only one and the one he is currently married to, he is faithful to her, meaning he is legally married to her and he's not a runaround, you know, he's not a flirt, he's not one of these individuals. He is a one, uh, one man woman, one woman man, that, that type of thing. Okay? It can mean that. 
And there are all kinds of arguments to support positions in between these two. I've heard churches you know, uh, will select deacons who are widowers, and, you know, they're widowers and they're remarried, okay, but if you're divorced and remarried, no. Or uh, widowers and divorces are okay, um, but polygamists, no. You know, so there's all kinds of ways that you, can, that you can do this. The one position, however, that is absolutely sure and biblical that no one will dispute is the man who has been married to the same woman all of his life. So that man definitely does qualify. And if you choose this interpretation or if you choose to, to apply this passage in this way, then you are sure of the scripturalness of your choice. Uh, no one can dispute uh, the choice that you have made. It may mean those other things. It may, it may, you, know, you may be able to broaden the pool of individuals you know, by interpreting that passage in, in a, a more broad way. But if you narrow it down to simply selecting those men who have only been married one time and they are still married to that woman, well, you're sure that you are in line with this passage. So he finishes the qualifications of deacons by stating that part of the testing that they must pass is the fact that they manage their homes and their families well. Okay? So if a man cannot take proper care of his home and his personal affairs, can he better care for the meeting place or the affairs of the family of God? So the idea is that you have to prove that you can do a good job as a servant in your own home before you can be appointed to a specific task of service in the family of God. So in the final verse, he talks about the deacon's reward and standing. And I'm going to discuss that particular subject as well as the idea of laying on of hands and all that business. We're going to talk about that next time. So let's summarize. Let's conclude several key ideas so far as deacons, as far as deacons are concerned. First of all, we say that deacons are servants chosen by the congregation according to specific qualifications and they are appointed by the elders to carry out specific tasks. Secondly, although women served in specific ways and they still do, there is no teaching or clear example in the New Testament to suggest that they were appointed by the elders to serve in the role of deacons as men as men do. And you need to remember that the writings, you know, people say yes, but you know, the church fathers and the writings in the third and the fourth and fifth century you know, talk about deaconesses and you know, there's no use denying that they do, yes. But we, we don't base what we do in the church, we don't base what we do on the writings of just non-inspired men, even if they lived a long time ago. The only information that we use to make up our minds on how we are to do things is the Bible. Only the inspired writers are the writings that we refer to in order to make policy, if you wish, in the church. Who's going to serve? How are we going to serve? How do we do things? How do we resolve disputes? We may gain insight by reading books and, 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 and getting information from the early church fathers and other experts and theologians and so on and so forth. However, uh, uh, our decisions are based only on what the Word of God says. So if you only have the New Testament to go by, only the New Testament, then it is very clear uh, by, by teaching, by example, uh, by direct command, that the idea of male spiritual leadership is something that needs to uh, be established and continued uh, throughout history. Okay, and then one other thing, the New Testament does not prohibit men or women who have been married before from being members of the church or participating uh, in worship or serving the body of Christ. But in order to be selected as an elder or a deacon, the man must be the husband of only one wife. Now, that's not condemning you know, other people. 
It merely creates a standard that will protect elders and deacons from criticism and division should there be a question about their past. You know, we don't impose this view on other congregations. Other congregations, you know, they look at this passage, they want to perhaps widen the pool of, of potential men who might serve as elders or deacons, they interpret this in a certain way, yeah, fine. You know. It's not our habit here in this congregation to impose our way of doing things, how we see the scriptures, on other, on other congregations, especially for these matters. Certainly for matters of salvation, who is Christ, the inspiration of scripture, we might speak out. But you know, uh, in the churches of Christ, each congregation, each eldership uh, is uh, responsible for this flock, this congregation, and not for other, uh, for other congregations. So, uh, uh, so let's, let's be thankful that God has designed this system for, for the church. We're not organized you know, a top-down, we're not like the government. We're not organized like the government. Top, there's a president and then there's you know, advisors and cabinet officials and then there's local chieftains and then there's the Indians down at the bottom. No offense to um, you know, uh, uh, Native Americans here, but you know what I'm saying, the people at the bottom. That's not how the church is, is organized. The church is organized uh, by uh, uh, individual congregations, autonomous from one another, and linked together because of their belief that only the Bible is God's word, uh, linked together by the belief that if we follow God's word, uh, we will have commonality. There may be differences of approach and so on and so forth, but we will have commonality because we are all uh, focused, uh, we are all dedicated to following only the New Testament in order to organize and establish the New Testament church. And it seems to work. You know, there are about 10,000 churches of Christ uh, in the United States alone. And uh, if you visit any one of those, you know, you'll find that they're pretty much doing uh, the same thing, approaching things pretty much in the, in the same manner. Well, one other thing I want to mention is thanks be to God that the requirements for membership in the Lord's church are a sincere repentant heart, a belief that Jesus is the Son of God and a willingness to obey Him in baptism. Uh, these are requirements uh, that rule nobody out from salvation. There are certain restrictions as to who can serve as leaders and deacons and preachers and so on and so forth. There are certain qualifications and leaders uh, for those positions, but to enter into the church, to be added to the church, to enter the kingdom of God, there are no types of restrictions. Uh, God recognized that all are sinners, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, Romans uh, 3.23, all need salvation in Christ. Everyone comes into the church in exactly the same way. They confess Christ as the Son of God, they repent of their sins, and they are immersed in water or baptized for the remission of their sins. And uh, this is the entry into the kingdom of God. It's open for everybody and we praise God for that. Okay, well that's our lesson for this time. We'll continue with this series at the next appointed time.